if you're not already muted, please stay muted throughout the day. Unless you have a question. Hey, phone call person, if you know how to mute yourself, would you do that? You can mute um, the phone that ends in seven eight or not, but we're hearing a lot of static from that end. Testing, can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. So welcome everybody. Um, I don't probably have to introduce myself. I don't know, just in case I'm Andrew Smith. I'm Sangha member, student of uh, Lama Jinpa. Uh, so we're going to talk today, obviously. Um, Who's our Oomze for today? Awesome, Patty. Do you want to go ahead and get us started? Um, I, I just have one question. Do we, do we do this three times or one time? Chang 
Pema gesar dong pola Yatsen joki ngeuk jeuk nek Pema jung ne shay su cha Kordu ka jo mang po kord Keki jay su da juki Chinji lok che shak su so Guru Pama Siddhi Ho. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, humsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer. Glorious Victorious One, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, Foe Destroyer, Glorious Victorious One, Shakyamuni. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have my glasses, friends. Teacher, Foe Destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, know of the world, humsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, know of the world, humsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, while abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, Bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, in all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing, and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings 
be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit I create by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. All my masters, my dons, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam Guru Ratnam and Dalakamna Yatayami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling on Massive Vultures Mountain, on Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, <laughs> Arya, Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon the world correctly and repeatedly be held in one of five aggregates which also is empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. What the heck? Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, and composition of factors are empty. I'm getting a little bit of feedback, friends. So check your check your microphone, friends. Shari Putra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shari Putra, therefore, in emptiness there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye, and so on, and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there's no suffering, origination, cessation of path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All, excuse me. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, completely, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata, gate, gate, paragate. We'll say the next 20 mantras silently to ourselves.
Ayata gate gate par gate par sam gate bodhisattva. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you've indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Shariputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. So welcome everybody. Thank you, Hattie. Um, so, uh, getting feedback. Okay. So, um, the title of my talk today is uh, Meeting This Moment and Bringing It to the Dharma. Uh, I wanted to kind of share a little bit about um, how I decided to come to this talk. Uh, so this is actually my first talk in quite some time. My last talk was on March 8th uh, of last year, which um, you might recall was uh, an interesting time as well. And uh, I had prepared a talk on chronic pain in the Dharma. And um, as I was getting ready, preparing it and getting ready for March 8th, it, it felt like uh, there was this tsunami of this other thing going on that maybe needed to be talked about a little bit more. So um, I kind of shelved the chronic pain talk and gave a talk on fear and COVID-19. Um, and uh, then, of course, that was second to last talk uh, before um, we went virtual. And um, so in December, Connor asked me to do another talk. And I started thinking about what I wanted to talk about. And I was kind of batting around some ideas I've been having on meditation and start to try, try to uh, put together the talk. And I just found that um, I couldn't really concentrate very well. Typically, um, I tend to over-prepare my talks out of nervousness and um, spend a lot of time, a lot of darshans and um, lots of reading and, and just uh, sitting with the material uh, before I actually give the talk. Um, my favorite thing to do is to go to Land of Medicine Buddha for uh, like a long weekend and, and do a retreat and uh, work on my talk there. And barring that, is, uh, I love to just sit in a cafe um, and, and get my talk done. And, and those things are not available, obviously, right now. And so um, it's basically home because uh, there's very few places these days indoors where you can sit. Um, and uh, there's, there's uh, home is wonderful, but it has uh, family and, and pets and laundry. And so I was just finding it really hard, not just from those practical things, but what I was bringing was this really scattered energy. Um, I just couldn't seem to put two thoughts together um, to really focus on what I was reading. Um, and so I decided to kind of take the easy way out and then dust off my chronic pain talk. And um, so I started doing that, thinking, oh, well, I'll, I'll just give them this that pain talk. And um, it's not a bad talk. You may get it at some point. But uh, I, I went to Darshan a week ago last Friday with Lama, and it was two days after um, the Capitol riots. and um, you know, I had watched it most of Wednesday, just fascinated and horrified. And um, I told him, kind of in, in kind of confessional style, I guess, you know, I might have this talk I'm going to give next Sunday, but um, it, it feels like when I wrote it was a century ago, and um, I'm not really connecting to it very well. And um, I was kind of secretly hoping he would... Uh, absolve me and say, there, there, I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm sure you'll do a great job. And of course, he didn't do that. Um, he said, well, maybe you should talk about what's on your mind. 
know, maybe uh, what's going on is more important, and that's that's uh, what you can give to people and, and where you can kind of come from. And, um, so uh, I like the skillful means of that. Um, I think um, on the one hand, it was like, yes, that, that makes sense, because one of the best things I, I have about doing these talks is uh, I hope they're beneficial to you, but I shouldn't say but, and they're very beneficial to me. As I prepare them, um, I connect more to my practice and I learn from them. So um, it felt like, you know, he was saying, you need to learn something from this moment. You need to, um, yeah, bring it to the Dharma. And so that's kind of what I, I uh, decided is I'll, I don't have the opportunity to over prepare. Um, hopefully it's not too under prepared, but it's, it's definitely not, um, over prepared. So, uh, I just thought this would be a useful, uh, topic for today because I have to feel like I'm not the only one who's a bit struggling with this moment in, in history, if you will, with everything that's been going on. So, um, yeah, so that's where I am. Um, you know, how do, how do we understand these? Current struggles outside of us, inside of us, and bring it to the Dharma. One of the, uh, I've, I've been with the, uh, Sangha now since 2012, and, um, early on, some of you might remember, uh, before we had a, a physical temple, we were kind of bouncing around and we'd be at the Marriott sometimes in, in this, uh, room, this meeting room. And so one of uh, the early Lama day long retreats was there, and this woman asked him, how do I bring the Dharma to my daily life? And without missing a beat, Lama said, the question you should be asking is, how do you bring your daily life to the Dharma? And uh, that really stuck with me as, as a very valuable pearl. Um, I've actually kind of come to realize it's, it's kind of both and, right? Because uh, Lama also says that Dharma is training for real life. So it's, it's kind of a dynamic tension, a toggling back and forth. Um, how do we bring our lives to the Dharma? How do we bring the Dharma to our lives? So hopefully we can discuss that today. Um, and I really do want um, to hear from you guys, because um, as much as I hope this is helpful to you, um, I hope that you can be helpful to me and to each other. I mean, that's what Sangha is about in this time of great isolation. Um, it's nice that we have each other as a community. Um, and uh, just a confession. I'm going to actually challenge myself today. Um, if I haven't already, uh, I'm, I'm challenging myself by not trying to read too much to you. Um, I have some uh, performance anxiety, stage fright, if you will. And uh, so I tend to over over read and I'm trying not to do that today. I'm trying to break free of that habit. Um, and uh, something kind of funny struck me today. Maybe you guys have heard of that advice that's given for stage fright of, of picturing everyone in their underwear, picturing the audience in their underwear. And I realized that uh, for all I know, all of you are in your underwear right now, um, at least from the waist down. So uh, that's what I'm imagining. So that's helping me right now. <laughs> so um, so uh, the sources for my talk today is mostly uh, Darshan with Lama um, and uh, some from Venerable Sangye Kadro at um, Travasti Abbey, a trunk for Rinpoche, and, and a little sprinkling of Pema children. So um, a little bit more about kind of where I am at this moment, just in my own life, just to share with, with you on that. Um, I would count myself as fairly fortunate in many ways. Um, I have not been sick. Um, I've been fortunate to be one of the first people vaccinated because I was I am a healthcare worker. Um, no one in my immediate inner circle has been sick. Um, not too many of my friends have gotten sick. Um, I think distant family got sick, but uh, didn't have a severe illness. Uh, I do work um, at a hospital, a county hospital. Um, in a family medicine residency program, and um, many of the people I work with um, are working very much directly with COVID patients um, on a daily basis, and uh, a number of them have gotten sick. Um, some of them have lost family members to the illness. 
Um, and part of my job is to uh, help them with their wellness. Uh, it's a stressful job being a physician. Um, and uh, so they look to me to try to kind of help them to cope. And that's been increasingly challenging for me. Um, we had a recent um, kind of wellness meeting where um, I asked the question and found out that some of them are having to make really hard ethical choices now about who gets care. Um, sending people home to die that might could have stayed longer and, and had their lives prolonged. And so that weighs heavy on them and, and on me to hear that. Um, the thing that I think really sent me over the edge recently was um, there was a new storage bin right outside of our offices, um, refrigerated storage bin. And, and I asked our receptionist if she knew what that was. And she said, that's where they're putting the excess bodies that um, they can't take to the morgue uh, because the family members may have COVID themselves and can't come identify them and, and take care of them. And there's just too, not enough room at the morgue. So we have a makeshift morgue right outside my office. Um, and I just, I really just felt this heaviness uh, thinking about that, thinking about this, those poor people that are just laying there stacked up. And um, just, you know, Cynthia, my wife will tell you that I just came home with just so much heaviness. And, uh, just felt this heaviness that I couldn't really shake. And I, I realized um, that that's probably the closest I'm ever going to get to a charnel ground. Um, and, and, you know, it really made me think about the charnel grounds. And for some of you um, that don't know what a charnel ground is, uh, I think it's mostly in India, if I'm, if I'm right. Um, it's a place where they would um, just take uh, people who died and, and they stack them on this this uh, kind of pile. And I'm not sure if they burned them or not, but it was a place that um, obviously was, a, was just a horrifying place to be. And um, it's, it was, and I think still is, a, a common practice for Buddhists to go to the charnel ground um, to see that everything is disintegrating immediately. That, the things are really momentary, and if we're paying attention, there's absolutely nothing to hold on to from a, a relative standpoint. You know, all conditioned things are impermanent, as the Buddha said in his, in his, his last words. Um, it's also maybe what we think of as the second thought that turns the mind, um, that we are all going to die, and, and that, um, again, all conditioned things are impermanent. And, um, practice with diligence. Use this time while we have it. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm trying to take from that. Um, you know, one of the ways I'm trying to bring it to the Dharma, if you will. We just have this illusion that everything is solid and permanent, but that's that, that illusion um, that we cling to just only brings us suffering. So from a previous Darshan with Lama, um, when we talked about charnel grounds, he told me it's important for us to go to the charnel grounds uh, if not literally, metaphorically. Um, and those are the places that scare us. Um, there's a lot of that these days, right? Um, this is where we're going to liberate the, the demons, the demons of ignorance, grasping, envy, pride. He says that all the demons need wisdom and compassion. Uh, he also pointed out to me that we use the charnel grounds as a motivation for renunciation. Renunciation is when we stop trying to seek our salvation in samsara. Pema Chodron says that renunciation is when we realize that our nostalgia for wanting to stay in a protected, limited, and petty world is just insane. Mama says renunciation is why would we want to pursue solidifying things? Hang on a sec, a technical adjustment. Why would we want to pursue solidifying things when it's impossible and painful? You know, we want to get to that point where we just say, I'm just done. I'm just done with this. He says that renunciation is like when you're drowning 
and you get your head above water. Or it's like you're in a sinking boat and a sea serpent comes along and says, climb on my back, it'll be okay. I like to think of, of renunciation as um, sometimes people think of it in a negative light, like you're giving up something, you're moving away from this safe space, if you will, or familiarity. Um, but I like to think of it as moving forward. Something hopefully that we're, we're always doing is, is growing and, and uh, yeah, moving forward in our lives. And so that's, that's for me, a, a more hopeful way of thinking about renunciation. Um, I, I think it's a lot easier these days to realize suffering. Um, you know, Lama talks about um, samsara as being horrific. Maybe you guys have heard him say that in Darshan. He said that to me several times. And we need to see it that way. We need to see samsara as horrific. And when things are going well, it's easier to kind of pretend like it's not. Um, and so right now, it's pretty hard to say that things are going well. Um, on, on so many levels, it, 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 things feel out of control. Um, you know, and they, there's intersecting out of controlness with um, the surge that's been this second or third surge that we're having that's been with us now since Thanksgiving time. Um, this political upheaval that uh, is, is so unstable uh, and so much um, energy, angry, rageful, fearful energy that, that's out there. That's, and, um, I don't know about you, but it's hard not to get infected by that energy sometimes and, and to feel the suffering very palpably. Um, and so Lama says that this is awareness of samsara. Um, you know, samsara is wanting what we don't have and not wanting what we have. Um, I think that's very true right now, right? I mean, um, we don't want this pandemic. We don't want this unrest. Uh, we want to be able to, I want to have a massage. I want to go to the movies and, uh, go to a restaurant. I, I want, I want, I want. And, um, so this is samsara. This is the suffering that, that um, it's important that we notice. Um, you know, again, Lama says that, that using some sorrow, recognizing its horrificness is, is what brings us more to the Dharma. It's just, he said that we're all in a burning building um, and, and time's a waste and we need to do what we can to get out of it. So Lama had also said that we need to uh, learn how to work with our present day horrors from small, medium, and large scope. Um, and, and this is some of you will remember this is from the stages of the path to enlightenment, the Lam Rim. Um, and, and Lam Rim, it talks about three scopes for Buddhist practitioners. The first is small scope, and that's um, what can the Dharma bring to my life to make it easier, happier, more tolerable. Um, the second is medium scope. And how can I use the Dharma for my own enlightenment and liberation? And then large scope is how can I attain liberation for the benefit of all beings? Uh, this is Mahayana scope. Um, I don't know about you, but when I hear those things, of course I want to be in large scope. Um, you know, skip past those first two and go straight to large scope, right? And why, why waste time? Just get at it. Um, Lama says we should always be looking, and I'm going to get back to that. Uh, in a second. The Lama says we should always be looking at how we can work with present day horrors from small, medium, and large scope, that all three are important. He says that ideally we're working on all three scopes simultaneously with the twists and turns of life, uh, not finding any dead ends or corners. And when Lama, when Lama said that, it made me think about the labyrinth. I don't, I haven't seen it lately in this office at Middleway, but um, he showed me this labyrinth. He has this beautiful labyrinth one day. And I think it's such a wonderful metaphor for, for uh, you know, the path and the scopes. Just, uh, and it, some of you may have had the pleasure to actually walk a labyrinth. And there's one where I live in Elk Grove. Um, and you think that you're going along nicely and then making progress toward the center. And then all of a sudden it kicks you out. And uh, at some point you're 
you're very much near where you first began. And uh, instead of um, feeling dis discouraged or disillusioned, you have this awareness that you're eventually going to get to the center, that you're going to get there. Um, and so you don't have doubt and you don't get discouraged. You just keep going. And that's the path, right? Um, sometimes we're going to be on small scope, medium, or sometimes we're going to be on large scope. And, and we have to be able to recognize and, and work with all three. Lama says that right now we're all mostly in small scope. He says that big event, events and situations can move us down from Mahayana scope to small scope. And we have to be honest about this fact and not get discouraged. He says we should be telling the truth to ourselves that right now we're in small scope. And also what I, made me think about um, the psychologist and he thought of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Some of you may have heard of this theory. Um, it's kind of this uh, pyramid where at the very bottom, um, we, our, our basic needs are physiological, our, our survival needs, um, food and uh, clothing, shelter, things like that. And beyond that, the next one is safety needs, and then love and belonging needs, esteem needs, and, and then the, the very top is self-actualization needs. And, and so um, we're making daily decisions these days about our safety. So we're, we're either at, at number one or number two uh, most of the time. Um, so that's, that's akin to small scope, I think. Um, kind of another analogy that the Lama has used, and if you've seen this, is the hand in the face analogy. Um, and you can actually do this if you want to while you're at home, is just take your hand and, and put it like this and see what you see. And pretty much you see your hand, right? And maybe a little bit around that, but it's primarily your hand. And then as you kind of move it out like this, you still see the hand, but you can see so much more as well. But the hand is still there. And so maybe, you know, like that's where we are is, is trying to figure out how to move that hand back a little bit. It's not really our fault that the hand's there, but we have to figure out what to do to kind of move it backwards. Maybe that's part of what this talk is about. I think that, that many of us, not all of us, but many of us came to the Dharma out of our, our feeling of our own pain and suffering. Um, I like this term, big T and small T traumas. Um, another analogy I like that maybe you've heard is the snow globe analogy. Um, you, know, you need to let the flakes of the snow globe settle down to be able to see more clearly, um, to have a clearer view. The small scope is what leads people to therapy, I think. Um, you know, Lama says that too many people when they encounter Buddhism try to immediately jump to a large scope, um, which he says leads to Dharma trauma. I like that term. Uh, I think that's definitely true for me is um, I'm not as willing to acknowledge uh, where I am and thinking that I should be on this large scope and, and trying to uh, do so much to, um, to benefit others conventionally and, and then I burn out. So it's important to kind of be aware of where we are. Um, recognizing in small scope that it's still samsara, but that we can make it more orderly. We can not be a jerk. We, we can work to be liberated from fixed ideas and behaviors. Lama says if we can do those things, that's huge. So we really don't want to um, diminish small scope in any way, shape or form. Um, I've been noticing, um, you know, I think most of you know I'm a psychologist. I, I work at Middleway and as well as the hospital. And um, I, I tell my clients that, you know, they're, you know, most of them are coming in not so hot, not so great. Um, and I'm telling them it's understandable. Uh, it's kind of maybe different than what I used to. Um, like it's almost like I'd be worried about you if you weren't feeling bad right now. Um, you know, so what do you do with it from there, I think, is really the, the key. Um, Lama says that we have to acknowledge where we are right now without a sense of complacency. Um, he says that it's easy to become complacent in small scope. 
um, just kind of accepting the messed upness. It says that in medium scope, we can come complacent too by being overfocused on our own liberation. And in Mahayana, we can become complacent by becoming overwhelmed with too many sentient beings so that we get bogged down in relative truth. I certainly am, am guilty of this much of the time when I only focus on benefiting others through my work. Um, I can I can feel like, uh, well, I'm doing my part, right? It's it's right livelihood. Um, I'm helping people. Uh, but uh, Lama says that when we make sentient beings into thoroughly established beings from their own side, um, we tend to burn out. Um, he calls this the Buddhist martyr syndrome. So I, I think the, the key is how do we take care of ourselves and others and not become complacent, disillusioned, or martyrs? And that's what I've been working to figure out. So um, I thought, uh, those of you who listened to Lama's talk last week on defending the links to dependent origination, um, he talks about some of this, right? And he said that bodhisattvas tell the truth about how shitty things are. And at the same time, they tell people that there's a way out. He said that we're claiming essential screwed upness and essential goodness at the same time. Uh, another one of my favorite quotes from Lama is, when discouraged, encourage others. So, as I said, this is a time of extra and obvious suffering. Um, and uh, as bodhisattvas, uh, we're practicing wisdom and compassion. And um, I think it's important as we're trying to be compassionate to others, that we remember that compassion for all beings includes ourselves. Um, when we stay with compassion at that relative level, it, like I said, it's a recipe for burnout. It's useful for me to remember the difference between compassion and codependency as well. Um, codependency is kind of thinking about others' needs, caring about others' needs, but forgetting about one's own needs. Um, and so compassion really has to involve what you're going through, what I'm going through, what we're all going through. Uh, it's both ands, all of the above. Um, so I think it's important that we all ask ourselves, how can, how do I manage my own suffering so that I can be there for others? Um, how can I best be there for others? Um, how can that, when is that practical and when is that aspirational? What, what's the combination? What's the right formula? I know if I asked Lama, he'd say, well, that's obvious, so only give 49%. Um, and again, the one of the most cliched, but very true analogies that we use in, in therapy is the oxygen mask analogy. Um, when you get on a plane, you put your own oxygen mask on first for obvious reasons. If, if you don't, um, you and the, the other person may die. So we really have to be working on, in small scope, taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. Um, the uh, talk that, I'm not going to remember her name now, the, the nun from uh, Shravasti that I was listening to recently, it was based on Shanti Deva, and she was saying, uh, I see samsara and wish to be free of it. Other sentient beings are in it and wish to be free as well. I will take it upon myself to liberate myself in order to help them. I will get dragged down if I only focus on helping them conventionally. So even generating the mind of bodhicitta is of immense benefit to others. Lama said last week that in a crisis, we have to do more inner work. So, you know, sitting, practicing, uh, generating merit, um, saying our prayers, all of those things are of immense benefit. We really don't want to sell them short. Um, and I think I'm going to end my part of this with just the, I always kind of go back to the lojong as, as one of the things of what do I do? And uh, so talking with Lama, um, there were two Lojong slogans that, that he mentioned to me. One was 
self-liberate even the antidote, and in post-meditation, be a child of illusion. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what uh, Trungpa Rinpoche says about that one, because I think it's useful as well for right now. So I'm going to read from, from his book. You realize that after you finish sitting practice, you do not have to solidify phenomena. Instead, you can continue your practice and develop some kind of ongoing awareness. If things become heavy and solid, you flash mindfulness and awareness into them. In that way, you begin to see that everything is pliable and workable. Your attitude is that the phenomenal world is not evil, that they are not going to attack you or destroy you or kill you. Everything is workable and soothing. Some nice words to kind of finish with. Um, so now I, I want to kind of open it up to you guys. I'm going to hear um, either, you know, raise your virtual hand or, or start speaking, or if chatting is more comfortable for you, I'm sure Connor can moderate that. But how are you meeting this moment, and how are you bringing it to the Dharma? What What do you find that's, that's benefiting you? Because I know we're all having to figure this out right now, ongoingly, but for me, it's it feels like, especially now. So I want to hear from you guys. Hey, Andrew, it's Ellen. I had a couple of reactions to your talk and comments. I'll just jump yeah. in unless somebody else is uh, ready before me. Um, a couple of things struck me. One is that when you talked about the storage container outside your office, it sort of created this this rising of like kind of like that lump in the throat feeling. And I still feel it. And it's going to make me sort of even get cheery talking about it. And it's interesting because I've been to your office. Um, and it's, you know, it's not like the executive penthouse office. It's just this little sort of dreary hospital office and probably the only redeeming thing about it other than all that you accomplished there is that there's a window you know and you get to look out and now you look at that and just picturing that really just had the experience of what you described be ethereal in my body and I likened it to something I realized well, yesterday or so that in my yoga practice I usually practice yoga with some friends and with COVID it's much restricted and we're even right now not, don't have a regular Zoom schedule. And I reached out and asked my friends, hey, can you get on Zoom this morning with me? Because I just find myself cheating all the way through my practice if I don't have some friends, you know, to, I don't know, have the energy. And there's something about making things real that makes them so much more alive or makes me alive in my life. And just like your description of that storage container, I haven't had people real close to me be impacted by COVID and I hide out in my little house and whatnot. I don't have a job like yours, but just to hear that story, it makes it so much more real and moving for me, you know, and, and just like with yoga this morning, when I got to see three of my friends on zoom and we started together and ended together, it was so much stronger than when I just am by myself and my house and my dogs and it's boring and, and so I think maybe there's a key is to try to figure out always how to make these things feel alive and real, you know, and it's a lot, all of it's a lot harder right now in COVID, but it's even just true of our practice, how to relate to it more and, and um, connect with it more. And I, you know, I started playing with that a little bit. Something else you said about lower scope and higher scope. I feel like with the goings on in my life, I've been stuck in lower scope for like a year and I'll have a bit more. And it's all about basic needs, you know, food, shelter, family, who's going to love me, you know, all these basic things. That, and, and I know it and I hate it, though. I hate it. <laughs> I hate that I'm there. Um, so there's something about hating it that is resisting it, I think. Or I mean, I know it has to be that way and I just have to get through some stuff. And, but, you know, maybe putting those two together, figuring out what is there that I can do, you know, how can I use slow jong and and giving and receiving to connect with others that maybe feel the same way, or how can I make even that experience more enlivened? And so anyway, I just really appreciated everything you said. And my takeaway is, yeah, we got to keep trying to figure out how to make these things 
like real and and connect with them and then take ourselves in that connected mode back out to the world so very helpful thank you as always thank you for your talk thank you yeah i was thinking about the labyrinth again while you were talking like uh moving back out I'm like damn it i was making such good progress <laughs> right but but just knowing I, I i think it's that it's I don't know, fake until you make it to the right term, but um, just recognizing that this is part of that path. This is part of the path that um, we have to bring it all to the Dharma. I mean, um, samsara is, is how we get to liberation. Uh, we move through it. We, we don't shy from it. We, uh, we're in it. We can't escape it, right? So we're just all feeling it more, more so. Um, and that's, yeah, but... I'm totally with you, Ellen. I, I mean, I'm like, I'm, you know, I've, I've backslid as a Buddhist. <laughs> That's what it's been feeling like. Like, you know, I'm not reading enough or, or it's like, it's easy to go to a Dharma guilt place. That's not healthy. So thank you, Ellen. How about other people? I can say something. Yeah. I okay. Hi. <laughs> One of the big problems is uh, watching too much negative stuff in the news. And a lot of people like to watch that. And it sucks you in and gives you a great adrenaline rush. <laughs> so I really have to watch. Not wa I watch very little news. Uh, if... It would be good if there's a way of discussing it with people who have a similar way of relating spiritual teachings to what you're seeing. But one thing that's been helpful is that I get, I, I donate to various uh, groups and they provide magazines on what they're doing. And a lot of that is a lot of positive stuff is still going on in the world. They're still managing to take care of people. One organization actually sort of headed this off in the past, has starting in March, providing all kinds of uh, equipment and uh, health kits to people in the countries they're working in in Africa. And, and so it's good to get other viewpoints besides the standard viewpoint that I see on TV. I think I, I was just reading something actually from Thich Nhat Hanh where he said, it's, it's important to stay in touch with the suffering of the world to nourish the awareness of all the things that are going on, but not take too much in. It's like overdosing on a remedy. <laughs> yeah, that's that's well put. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes I have filtered the news conventionally by uh, watching it through something like The Daily Show, mm -hmm. uh, a little comedy bent to it. Um, <laughs> But a, a dharmic bent to watching the news I, I re increasingly um, enjoyed or found helpful is uh, the Sravasti Abbey teachings. Mm. Um, a lot of their talks are on current events. I learned stuff from uh, Tupton Children's talk yesterday that I didn't even know that, about the whole capital C. So uh, they're very much talking about it and, and uh, putting it into some context. Oh. Uh, so that could be helpful as a way to kind of engage the news. I was remembering uh, Morris's term from last week, doom scrolling. Um, <laughs> It's very easy to, uh, especially when the news is just seeming to be like every five minutes, there's something. Uh, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen now? It's like this, uh, that Beatles song, um, A Day in the Life, and there's this like crescendo, this discordant crescendo. Uh, it, it kind of in one part in the song, right near the end. That kind of feels like we're in this discordant crescendo. Um, 
And so it, it, it's kind of almost forcing you to pay attention. But, um, you know, it's hard. It's hard to kind of find that right balance because there is some dopamine burst. Uh, I think that uh, Mr. Trump has, has been uh, the negative attention is better than no attention thing. And um, uh, you, it's like a train wreck or a car accident. You can't look away. You're horrified, but you, you find yourself drawn to it. And so I think you're certainly not alone. I, I think I've been there too. Is trying to find that right balance with uh, being with the news, but not too much. Someone want to know about the the site? Was that Savasti Abbey? S S R A V A S T I Savasti Abbey. They have a YouTube channel. It's up in Washington. Uh, Tupton Children was going to come, and then COVID happened. So hopefully, maybe in 2021. Let's see. What's that? Zima? Oh, Elizabeth, yes. Elizabeth, did you have your hand raised? There you are. Hi. We can't hear you. Can you can you unmute? Hi. I'm unmuted. Um I was really struck about your by your refrigeration picture in my mind. And I am a newsaholic, but I'm particularly interested in the clinical side. And my background is in public health because I was part of a public health effort in San Francisco during the HIV AIDS. Um, so I kind of have a, a bit of a remove, but I really go for the clinical side, what's happening in the body, what's, I find that fresh and new, and then understanding the principles of public health and how things happen. And then also having worked as a provider in a hospital, at a certain point, everything is super real because people die right there in front of you or they're frozen in a box next to your window. It's uh, refreshing in that it's life and death. It's not uh, a long ways away. It's immediate. It's here. And that for me provides me with a very fresh uh, perspective, kind of gut wrenching and exciting. I don't know if that makes me perverse, but it is when things are immediate and present that makes my Dharma practice that much more powerful. Uh, and then the capital event, um, for many years, part of my family has been on the fascist <laughs> edge of total insanity and huge amount of suffering going on. So while I was very captivated and horrified by what happened, it's not outside of the scope of, at least in my family, there, there's a lot of mental health issues. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of things that are unresolved and, and not fixed and we've had a president that's a mental health problem uh, elected by mental health problems so it's a kind of a thing that hand in glove fitting so well i'm sick of being at home i find the whole thing that's going on fascinating and drilling down into the body and the virus and what's going on is fascinating the horror of death is, I don't want to sound perverse, invigorating in the, in the fact that this is a, this is a epic. I see this is epic. This is like uh, the Black Death, only we know uh, what's going on in the body and we know what's going to happen. And the, the 
public health department projects how many people are going to die in California or the United States. So you know, you, you know what's going on. So uh, I guess I, I do have a background in news. So I find, I'm a adrenaline junkie, but I find it fascinating and uh, uh, easily manipulated and historically uh, uh, something that I can place. I don't know, does that make me perverse? I, can, I guess I can relate in the sense of, um, as a psychologist, I find uh, Trump fascinating. Um, what makes his mind work or what makes the mind work of people who follow him and uh, this mass, it feels like a mass delusion uh, with not being able to, to, you know, a perception of reality that just seems so uh, far afield. I, it's interesting because I, I think everyone has a different thing that they bring. Um, I'm not so easily clinically fascinated by COVID as much as um, uh, just enervated and emotionally drained by it. And I think it's it's more because constitutionally, I, I, I very much feel other people suffering um, viscerally. I think it's part of what helps me be compassionate, uh, but it, it's also, it's a blessing and a curse, if you will. It's helped me have a good career, but um, I have to be very careful with it. I can't take too much of it in, otherwise I just shut down. So yeah, everyone brings a different energy, I think, but but how, how to bring that back to the Dharma, I think, is again the, the real key, is what do we do with that energy, right? I saw that Autumn said something in the in the chat. Um, did, did you want to um, just leave it as a chat, or did you want to uh, say something about what you wrote, Autumn? Okay, I'll I'll talk. I've been told that I shouldn't uh, talk when I have my kids. It could be on the recording. I don't mind if they're on the recording, but they may make sounds. But um, Elizabeth and I are both uh, news people, news women, so we have a little bit of a different outlook on it. But um, I just wanted to say that I thought it was interesting when I looked at the Dalai Lama's schedule that he actually does listen to BBC in the morning for 30 minutes a day generally speaking. So he stays informed, but then he's got hours upon hours of meditation and prayer and reading and things that he balances that with. So um, I, I, my takeaway from that was that, you know, it's good to stay informed, but to, you know, schedule it in such a way that you're balancing it with your own self care. So I just wanted to add that. But um, I totally understand Elizabeth's like it, it is a lot about perspective too, you know, like how you consume it, you know, if it's not good for you, then, you know, maybe the answer isn't to completely shut yourself off, but to, to schedule it at the best part of the day or to balance it, like meditate first and then, and then take it in or whatever, whatever it is. So that's all. That's what I was saying. And that's what my son has to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Autumn. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's it's finding that that proper balance is, is really key. Um, we're, we're in such an information age. There's no such thing as the six o'clock news, and that's where we get our news from anymore. Uh, so self self monitoring, self limiting. Uh, yeah, finding our own right filter. Uh, go ahead, Susan. You know, something Autumn said um, about the Dalai Lama schedule uh, sort of coalesced something for me. It's finding a balance. I think I've been trying to find a balance between conventional and ultimate. Uh, I've been trying to find a balance between active bodhicitta and um, uh, I don't know what do you call it, ultimate bodhicitta. Um, so 
I have various things that I do on a conventional level, you know, like, um, uh, you know, leading practices or um, being part of a book group that's studying um, things. And so I have things that I'm doing on, on a conventional level, seeing friends, walking, you know, just, just making contact. Um, but then um, during, it was actually, I think, during when, just when the uh, fires in Napa started uh, last summer, I was on a retreat with, um, in Sebastopol and I was retreating on the, um, the uh, text that Lama is now teaching um, on Buddha nature. And so I've been really, really focused on that text and on Maitreya practice and on cultivating loving love, not loving kindness so much, but that too, of course. But anyway, so that's that's where my ultimate practice has been going is is in that sphere. Um, not so much compassion as just love. Um, but I mean, obviously they, they overlap terrifically. But so I've been trying to do this balance um, so that I make sure that I've got a lot of conventional, or I've got is enough conventional contact and enough conventional work that is making me feel like I'm not useless, you know, in my, my isolation. Um, but I also have upped my hours of practice and have broadened um, what it is that I'm studying and meditating upon to make it in a, a more, um, a bigger, vaster scale. So I just, I'm just personally trying to balance that. And I think that's kind of what the Dalai Lama does, right? I mean, he has that half hour of like, you know, let's, let's listen to BBC news and then, oh my God, let's go sit, um, you know, let's go do practice. So anyway, that was, that was just something that, that occurred to me while I was listening to Autumn. Well, for what it's worth, Susan, um, while I was listening to you, I, I initially kind of reflected on how our, our the rhythms of our lives are just different in, in the phases of our lives that we're in right now, um, where the hours in my day are very much taken up with um, responsibilities, uh, conventional. And um, listening to you uh, talk about how you're balancing your conventional and ultimate um, was inspiring to me. Um, I feel like I'm taking something from you with that. And so I think that as Sangha, maybe that's something we can do is, is uh, uh, benefit each other, whatever's going on in our own lives, uh, not to, to go into a Dharma comparison or, or um, uh, you know, envy or, or pride or anything like that, but more just uh, complimenting each other with what we're bringing to the Dharma um, and the Sangha, right? Um, so uh, your, your practice is benefiting me, if you didn't know that. So thank you. Anybody else? Adam, this is Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia. I just wanted to show you this painting that's right behind me. It's a painting that I was, it's a painting that I was working on yesterday. And uh, I um, felt so much about what you said about that feeling of the trailer right outside your office, that kind of hovering in space and sort of transitory and not quite sure where you are. And I felt that was very much in this painting that's about, you know, it's a Canadian goose. Up here where I live, um, there's a lot of fog right now and the geese are here. And uh, so this is a goose that's taking off from a vernal pool uh, in the valley. But it's just taking off, it's not quite lifting off. There's a weight about it 
So it's hovering in that kind of space that I felt that you were describing. I wanted to share it with you. Thank you. What a wonderful way to uh, connect to the Dharma with uh, not, not just words, but images. Thank you. Where are you at now, Cynthia? You said you're in a place where there's a lot of fog. Cynthia, can you hear me? The thing that's interesting about uh, Canadian geese also is that their wings end up having all kinds of holes in them because of the great distances that they fly. And so um, the wing on this goose at the very top, I'm going to leave it the way it is because I've been painting it. It's got this kind of reddish color, but there's holes in the wings as well. And I'm finding that a kind of incredible symbolic uh, uh, statement about this notion of lifting off, but you can't, you can't quite lift off. You can't quite get there. Uh, and then you can't even grab some air because there's like holes in the wings. The geese are huge. They're, they have, they're very heavy. It's amazing when they fly over the, in these big flocks, they look so light and beautiful, but they're really very big birds. Mm. Well, uh, I just saw lots of comments Thank you. Uh, relating to that, um, relating to your painting and, and your words. So thank you, Cynthia. Anyone else? So one thing, um, let's maybe we can transition over to in the announcements. Um, there's one that I want to give you that Connor brought to my attention. Um, perhaps it, it can relate to some of this. Uh, speaking of His Holiness, on uh, January 22nd, um, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., actually it says Indian Standard Time, so I think we need to figure out what that means for us. <laughs> 7.30 p.m.? Oh, perfect. So a little easier. 7.30 p.m. on the 22nd. His Holiness is giving a talk on well-being and resilience, followed by a question and answer session with students of the British School in New Delhi. Um, so, yeah, that might be something that you can check out and see what, what His Holiness has to offer. Any other announcements? Yes. Patty. Yes, I, I just uh, I just thought, you know, sometimes when we would meet in person, um, we would talk about a clear box for donations. And uh, since we don't have, since we're meeting in this way, I think maybe our clear box instead is the, the donation button that's on the website. So uh, I just wanted to mention that just because um, we, we want to still support our center. I mean, some of us, a lot of us here, some of us amazingly so are already donating so much, but if you have a little extra, just as if we have a box, we could think of it that way. So. Thank you. Um, and Connor just put a, a, a text up, I think that was you, Connor, about Lama Jinpa teaching tomorrow night on Buddha nature. Okay, so um, if there's no other announcements, let's go on to closing prayers. Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel of bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful, Chanvizig, Tenzin, Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends.
May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the Snowyland sages, Osang Drakpa, and make requests at your holy feet. The verses that save Sakya from sickness, a prayer for pacifying the fear of disease. May all the diseases that disturb the minds of sentient beings and which result from karma and temporary conditions, such as harms of spirits, illness, and, and the elements, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May whatever sufferings arise due to life-threatening diseases, which like a butcher leading an animal to the slaughter, separate the body from the mind in a mere instant, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May all embodied beings remain unharmed by acute, chronic, and infectious diseases, the mere names of which can inspire this, the same terror, as would be felt in the jaws of Yama, Lord of Death. May the 80,000 classes of harmful obstructors, the 360 evil spirits that harm without warning, the 404 types of disease, and so forth, never cause harm to any embodied being. May whatever sufferings arise due to the, the disturbances of the four elements depriving the body and mind of every pleasure be totally pacified and may the body and mind have radiance and power and be endowed with long life, good health and well-being by the compassion by the compassion of the gurus and the three jewels, the power of the dakinis, dharma protectors and guardians, and by the strength of the infallibility of karma and its results. May these many dedications and prayers be fulfilled as soon as they are made. Thank you, Patty. Patty. I also want to thank you, Peter. You guys don't see this, but he's got this whole command center here. It's like a lot of work and, and he's, it does a masterful job so thank you Father. and thank all of you for joining us today and uh may you all be well thank you much. thank you andrew connor and patty thank you thank you, thank you adam thank you thank, thank you, you andrew connor and patty